right, so I'm in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'll be spending some time in verse 17 all the way probably to the end of the chapter to verse 40. I think I'll be able to complete Hebrews chapter 11 in this message. In the previous message, I was in chapter 11 verses 8 through 16 where I was emphasizing the point that we are a part of something greater than ourselves and that this is something to, to, to be aware of. When you were living under the Old Covenant, the, the writer was writing to the Jews who were living under the Old Covenant, and he was encouraging them to embrace the New Covenant, which would result in them living a completely different way of life. And so he's giving them a description of, of that fact, that there's going to be something different. And one thing to keep in mind is that you are a part of something much greater than yourself. Okay, now when you are living a life according to the law or a life of repentance and obedience, when you are living that kind of life, whether it's the law of Moses, whether it is the law of the church, no matter what it is, if you are living your life in general with the expectation that your relationship with God, your right standing with God is going to be determined by what you do and by what you don't do, if, if that's what your relationship is about, then your focus will eventually, will eventually be completely, or relatively completely, on yourself. Your focus will become on yourself, and you will not, you will not be thinking so much about being a part of something greater. Because as we embrace reality, as we enter into the truth and we discover more and more the truth of God, and the truth of ourselves, then we will discover more and more that we are not obedient, we are not repentant, and we, 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 are, not, we are not living the life that, that we believe God expects us to live. And as a result, the focus on ourselves becomes greater and greater and greater, and our ability to respond to God will be reduced more and more as well because we are not. We are not meeting the standards that we believe he expects of us. In the new covenant, we have a new relationship that gets defined according to what he has done for us, not according to what we have done for him. And what we will do is we will then begin to live our life on that basis of what he's already accomplished, what he has already given to us as our inheritance in Christ. And this opens up a new relationship and so that we do live and we do things. But it's, it, it's, it's driven, it's motivated. The origin of that is completely different. Instead of trying to establish a relationship with God and maintain, sustain a relationship with God, we now live out of the relationship that we already have that is already secure. So when we are living our lives in the new covenant, our life is going to be a life of responsiveness. We are able to respond individually to what is going on in the personal interactions that we have individually with our God. That is what faith is. Faith is the response to the truth that is revealed to you. And everyone has their own personal relationship with the Lord on the basis of the new covenant. And so there will be a unique experience for everyone. And when it comes to what the Lord is sharing with you or with me or with somebody else, and that will be the unique truth that I respond to, that you respond to, that somebody else will respond to with whatever, is, with whatever it is that is going on in our lives at that time. Faith is the response to the truth that is revealed. And in the New Covenant, in the New Covenant, we have an individualistic experience like that. The writer goes on into verse 17, and he starts to speak of some of these examples where we can see that others had an individual experience with God where they responded to the truth that was revealed to them. And there were times when things worked out pretty good. There were other times when we would say, you know, that doesn't look like a good conclusion to me. But to remember that we are a part of something greater and to keep in mind that there is a future for us. 
there is something that is going to transpire in the future. There, you know, this is not just about right now. It's not just about now. It's not just about our life today, but that, but that the relationship we have the, with the Lord includes includes what we will experience, what we will have, and what we will encounter in the future. When we are living according to the law, there really is no future. Okay, there really isn't one. In, in Christianity, in general, throughout the history of Christianity, people have not lived giving much consideration to the future outside of just, just entering into the kingdom of heaven, but the future of their own lives and their own participation. They don't give much thought to it because they do live, people will in, in general, they will live according to a system of law, of repentance and obedience. Their focus becomes a focus upon themselves and they are not so much available for the Lord to work with to be a part of something profound in the future. And of course, and of course I'm just speaking in generalities. There are lots of individualistic examples where this is not the case and great things have, have, uh, have been experienced. But in general, this is one of the struggles. This is one of the struggles that, that, that has existed and will continue to exist Whereas when people are not really living in the inheritance of the inheritance of Christ that they have, then the future really, really looks pretty empty for a lot of people. Okay, let me go ahead and proceed into verse, uh, verse seventeen, Hebrews chapter eleven, verse seventeen, where the writer speaks again of Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, he who received the promises. All right, well, what was, what was the situation? Abraham had received the promise of, of, the, of, of the holy land, of, of the land, the land of Israel, that he would be the one who would have possession of that. He was given the promise that there would be descendants from him that would be so numerous that they that that, that that they could not be counted they would be as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore the sand on the seashore and so uh, abraham abraham had a set of promises and one of the and, and with there being descendants not just the land but there being descendants who would be able to occupy the land work the land defend the land he would need to have a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people to occupy that much space, you know, that much real estate. You're going to have to have a lot of people who are there in that land to occupy it, to work it, to defend it, that, that, that kind of thing. Abraham had received all these promises and things got started. He got his first son, Isaac, his first one. There he is. This is the guy where all of this is going to begin, through which all of this is going to begin. And God asked him to kill him. Asked Abraham, I want you to kill the one person, you know, that we got started with. I want you to kill him. Now, this was a big deal for Abraham. Is he going to do what God has told him to do or not? Now, I can just, I can just see, I can imagine that that however God communicated with Abraham, he must have done so in a clear way so that Abraham would have no confusion, no uncertainty about what God expected him to do. All right? I know sometimes I, you know, I talk with people and they, and they talk with me about their uncertainties as to whether or not God would like them to do something or not do something or what God is saying to them or what God is not saying to them and they're just not sure. And all I can say is, look, if you're not sure, chances are he doesn't have anything to say. You know, you, you should consider that. That if you're, if you're uncertain, then it could be that he's not doing anything. He's not saying anything. He's not, he's, he's not working with you on that basis right now. And that's okay. You know, it's, it's perfectly fine. He's, he's left it up to you to make decisions about what you're going to do or not do in your life right now. 
Uh, you know, we have a God who does not have a communication problem. And if he's got something to say to you, he's going to make it clear in one way or another. He will get that message across in a way that you will, you will know that that message came from him. I do believe that Abraham was certain that this is what God wanted him to do. And it's, this is described as a test. God was testing him. He, he, he was going to stop Abraham from killing Isaac. He was going to do that. But he was testing him. Now, this is profound. You know, because we could ask the question, well, does this mean he's going to test us? Is he going to test me? Is he going to test you? You know, well, there's no way to know. He might. He might not. It's difficult to say. And if he does, you know, if, if he was to test me, I, I have hope that I would pass the test well. You know, but I'm not going to be thinking, is this a test? That's not what I'm going to be thinking. If he has something that he would like me to do or not do, I believe he will make it clear. And I will do or not do whatever he shares with me. That's, that's how I will govern my life. If it's something that can be done, I will do it. And, uh, and, and if he desires to test me, then, then by all means he can do that. This, this would change the relationship between Abraham and God in a big way. You know, that the, the relationship between the two of them w would have this as a part of their eternal relationship. When they would see one another, when they would interact with each other, they would remember. You know, God, God would, would relate to Abraham and Abraham would relate to God with this memory that God really did test him. You know, and, and I personally, I would not like to have that kind of experience with God that whenever I saw him, he would, he would look at me and I would look at him as, yeah, he tested me. He tested me and I passed the test. And, and, and that's something that you know, if he would like to have between us, I, I will take it, no problem. But I'm just fine without it. You know, I'm just fine with, with the relationship based on trust without tests. You know, I'm okay with that. But between Abraham and God, the trust that they have with one another was tested and tested in a profound way. And so that when, when God and Abraham do things together, when they interact with each other, they know, you know, that there was a time when Abraham would have killed his entire future, all right, coming from his one son. He would kill his entire future if that's what God called him to do, called upon him to do. Uh, so, you know, that, that is something that, that genuinely happened. It was something between God and Abraham and how they worked through that is between them. And, uh, and, and because of that, it is possible that he may test other people in the future uh, or he may not. But there's no way there's no way to know. So, again, in verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. There, there is a hint of Jesus in this, such that just as Abraham offered up his only begotten son, God offered up his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus, for salvation. In, into verse 18, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Well, in a figurative sense, I can see that there is some truth to that. I, I, I can see that. I can appreciate that. However, it doesn't say this. All right. If you go through the account of Abraham and look at what happened and, and, and what we know about what happened and what was communicated in verse 19, it says, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Uh, it doesn't say that in Genesis. And so I don't know where the writer got this from, that, that Abraham believed 
that if he killed Isaac, God would resurrect Isaac. Where the writer got that, we don't we don't know. It's not recorded anywhere. So this 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 is another thing similar to what I described in the previous message concerning Sarah and her supposed positive attitude. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't have we don't have this much information. And so this is either the opinion of the writer that he has extrapolated from the scriptures. And, you know, I, I, I can see that that could very well be the case. I have done this with some passages myself where people have asked me, well, what do you see here? And I've, I've said, well, this is what I see. But of course, this is just what I see. It doesn't mean that this is really what happened. It's just my opinion, my perspective of, of what, I, what I am reading from, from, from this passage and what I believe would probably be uh, what happened and what people were thinking. But when I, when I state that, I do make it clear that this is what I think and is not what the Lord has said in any way whatsoever. And so in verse 19, this could be, this could be the opinion of the writer and what the writer believes Abraham was thinking. Uh, it could very well be the case. Or it could have been divine revelation where the Lord has shared some additional knowledge to the writer and the writer has the opportunity to document that right here, that this is what Abraham really was thinking back then. And that could very well be the case. But because, because the historical record does not say this, does, does, not, you know, does not relate this, I have to make it clear that, that this is something that is unique here in verse 19. But, you know, then the writer goes on, and that's the end of Abraham, goes on and, and continues and says, there have been others. This is not a new thing. To live a life by faith, responding to the truth that the Lord has revealed to you and making decisions in your life on this basis is not new. This has been going on for a long time. Abraham related to God in this way. Isaac related to God in this way. So for those of you who are living according to the law, you know, you're going to have to let that life go. There is another way of life, of responding to the truth, of living by faith. You either live by law or you live by faith. You're not going to be able to live by both. All right, those really are two completely different ways of life. So the writer is encouraging the Jews at this time to let go of the law to realize that there is something greater than themselves, something greater than the law, all right? That the life that we now have before us in the new covenant through our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus is much greater. To start thinking about the future, thinking about what's ahead of you, all right? That there is greatness that you can be a part of. And, and, and that the people will not enter into that if they stay with the law. And that was well observed. Because the people who were a part of the church in Jerusalem, right, their, their, their participation in the propagation of the gospel and of the new covenant was extremely small. All right, their participation in history and in the propagation of the gospel was small. And, of course, we know historically that, that life there in Jerusalem didn't go on for very long. All right, Eventually, in the, in the year 70 AD, there was a war. The Romans went in there and they decimated the place. Okay, Life changed in a big way for everybody there. All right, and so to think about greater things, to be a part of something greater, and to, to be a part of something that is eternal, because your God is, is involved in things that are eternal in nature, and their dependency on the law and on Jerusalem was very temporary. It was temporary, going to be very short-lived, and many of them lived to see that it was gone. All right, they live to see that. So the writer proceeds and he speaks about Isaac. Isaac lived by faith. 
In verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come, thinking about the future. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and, and worshipped, leaning on top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones, that, they, that the, the, the people would return to the promised land. In verse 23, he speaks about Moses. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. You know, well, that was pretty good. Lasted three months, right? You know, I mean, his parents, by faith, they, they held on to him for three months. And in this case, that's not necessarily a good example to pick. You know, I, I, I think I might have considered leaving that one out if I was writing this. But the writer put it in there and, and, and could very well have been inspired by God in order to do that. So, hey, I'm not going to not going to complain and say that it has to be removed. But if you think about this for just a moment... It would be like saying, well, by faith, Moses' parents did not throw Moses in the Nile for three months. You know, it lasted for three months. And then they threw him in the river. They did. All right. You know, that's a, that's a way of looking at that. Let's just go on to verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. All right. Now we—that's another thing. We don't—we don't have that recorded in Exodus. That's not recorded there. That that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We don't have an official refusal. So that's either an extrapolation that the writer has come up with, or, or his opinion concerning the attitude of Moses. Uh, at that time, or this could very well have been divine revelation to add to the historical record so that we can have more clarity concerning what was happening. Uh, but in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. All right, now I can see that he made that kind of a decision by putting himself at risk. You know, by putting himself at risk and and through putting himself at risk by 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 killing one of the Egyptians, uh, then in that sense, yeah, he did. He did choose not to enjoy the passing pleasures of the position that he had there in the Egyptian society. All right. I can I can see that, that there was a choice that was made, but he covered it up. You know, he covered it up. And so while he made the choice to 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 execute the murder, right, to, to execute the Egyptian. He made the choice to do that. He did so secretly and he covered it up. So it wasn't really a choice where he just said, I am going to reject the pleasures of Egypt. Not necessarily uh, because he did. He did try to cover it up. And so I, I am not sure that I could put that in the category of part of the historical record either. I think that that could be a reflection of the opinion of the writer, or maybe it is some additional divine revelation. All right. But there is something to say about that, that through the action of Moses, of his desire to try to execute justice and, and perhaps even set his people free from slavery, uh, through doing that, he definitely was beginning to think about the future. And he was starting to recognize that, uh, that the future was not going to be the same as the way it was at that time. Okay, in, in, in other words, while he may have been enjoying the pleasures of sin or the, the pleasures of, of being an Egyptian ruler, I think he, he recognized that this was not going to last forever. You know, not likely. This was not likely going to last forever. Every system of slavery eventually ends. Eventually, it comes apart for one reason or another. It, you know, the, the slavery can exist, and, and, and in some, some ways, uh, it may exist during your time. But, but give it some more time later on, and you will find that, that the world will change, life will change, circumstances will change, 
and, uh, and it will not go on. And so while the slavery had been going on for a long time there in Egypt, I think Moses recognized that, you know, if you think about the future and you think about how things change, it would be unlikely, unlikely that this system was going to continue, especially if he was to believe the promise that God made that they would leave Egypt, that they would exit and they would go into the promised land. So for Moses to believe in the God of Israel meant that he would believe that there would be a time when this system would end and to start thinking about the future. Think about the future and realize that you also can be a part of something that is greater than yourself. So I do believe that Moses was, was, was responding to the truth of the prophecy that God gave. That he was responding to the truth and he was looking for ways to be a participant in that which would be much greater than himself and to be a, to, to be a part of this change that was going to happen that the children of Israel were going to be set free from their slavery and they were going to establish a new country, a new nation somewhere else. All right. So in verse in verse 26, let me go back to verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. He was looking to the reward. What? What was the reward? The reward was to be a part of something greater than himself and that the reward would be to have a relationship with the living God, that the riches of Egypt were, was not greater, was not greater than being a participant in what God was going to do. And, this, and, 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 and what God was going to do would not necessarily look like what Moses had in Egypt. It, it, it would not be as wonderful. It would not be as great. The riches, not just measured in gold or silver, but also measured in food and, and in measured in the quality of life that he would be able to have. All right, that he recognized that what would come could very well be a lesser quality of life than what he had, but he would have the true God and that that would be a reward. That would be a, a, a richness. That would be something that would be much greater than anything that could possibly exist because he is now thinking about something greater than himself and he's thinking about the true and living God and being a participant and, and, and to be a part of those things that are eternal in nature, all right? To think about things in that way. This is something that the Jews would need encouragement with as well because their lives would be changed if they lived according to the new covenant. If they lived according to the new covenant there in the society at that time, all right, they would have a lesser quality of life. The people who did not believe in Jesus would reject them. They would, they would experience uh, you know, a big change in the sense of how they would be a participant in the society at that time. And so to say that, that you know, Moses made this kind of a decision, Moses made this kind of a decision. And, and so let go of the law of Moses, all right? Let go of the law of Moses and embrace the new reality of the new covenant, just as Moses let go of Egypt and the slavery of Egypt you let go of the slavery of the law. Let go of the old covenant and embrace the new. And yes, your quality of life in a physical sense may, may end up being less than what you had before, but you will be a part of something much greater, much greater than yourself and something eternal in nature and that you can grow in your relationship with God because you're not growing in your relationship with God when you're busy with these other things 
that God is not going to participate in. All right. You're, if you are if you are living your life with things that God is not a part of, then 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 he's you know your relationship with him, your relationship with him excludes, you know ha, has excludes that part of your life that he doesn't want to be a part of. All right. When you have a relationship with a person, there are things that you do without the person. There are things that you do with the person. And there are things that this person does without you. All right. Do so. So the writer is 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 in effect. He's encouraging the people. Look, be a part of those things that God is a part of. You can be a part of those things that He's not a part of. But that's not going to. Uh, that's going to be a waste of time, a waste of your life. All right. It's okay to have some things like that. It's not like it's it's evil, but it's in your interest to let go of many of those things. And in this case, God was not going to be a part of Egypt anymore. He was not going to be a part of Egypt anymore. He's going to leave with the children of Israel. So Moses can stay behind and be without God, or he can go with God and be a part of the new things that he's going to do. So also the, 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 the Jews at this time when this letter was written need to be encouraged to let go of the Old Covenant because God is not going to be a part of that anymore and to embrace those things that he is going to be a part of. And sure, this could result in a lesser quality of physical life, but that, that, that's fine because what you gain, the reward that you gain, which in effect is your God, the, the reward that you gain, you know, those who diligently seek him will find him, right? And the objective is to find him, All right? He is the reward. So when you, when you, when you embrace this, it's, it's easier to let go of things that God is not a part of and to be a part of those things that he is a part of and to embrace that. And as we have our individual personal relationship with him, he will, he will interact with us and, and those things will become unique. All right. So by faith, Moses, in, in verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. All right. He turned to his God by faith. He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Right now, that you know that was the end. That was when the Israelites and Moses officially exited their relationship with the Egyptians. All right. And, and, and you can see just how far the Egyptians were willing to go to keep the Israelites from exiting the relationship. You know, what was the relationship? If you were to ask Pharaoh, Pharaoh, what is your relationship with all of these people? What is what is your part and what is their part? And he says, well, the relationship is that they make bricks. I order them to make bricks. And if they don't make bricks, I will beat them until they make bricks, right? That's, that's the relationship. And the, and, and the Israelites decided that they wanted to exit that relationship. You know, and, and, the, and the Pharaoh, it, clearly he, would, he, he did not want this to happen. He did not want this to happen because then life for him would be different. You know, before you could ask him, Pharaoh, what's your job? Well, I order people to make bricks and I beat them if they don't. That's my job. That's my, that's my role. You know, that's, that's my, my participation in these people's lives. And, and, and this is good. All right. And, and if they decide that they don't want to have that kind of a relationship with him anymore, he's going to have to do something else. And if you were to ask Pharaoh, well, what would you do? Well, if you want bricks, you're going to have to make them yourself. All right. You're going to have to get a job. And you, and I can just tell, I could just imagine, and I can tell by looking at the at what happened, that Pharaoh was not interested in getting a different job. He really liked his job, ordering people 
to make bricks and beat them if they don't. He liked that job. All right. He wasn't willing to let that go. How far would he go to keep that job, to keep that relationship with these people? How far would he go? God killed his firstborn son completely destroyed his entire country economically, decimated the whole, the whole thing, all right? And, 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 and Pharaoh still wouldn't get a job, all right? He orders his army to follow these people and get them back, to, to, to go into the Red Sea, to follow them through the Red Sea, and there it required divine intervention to bring all that water down and drown all, the, all those people. All right, that's what it took. It took death. They had to kill, God had to kill Pharaoh. That's how far he would go. All right, and you know, there are some people in the world today who you may have a relationship with, and they may relate to you in a similar way that you do whatever they order you to do, and they will beat you if you don't. And they like that kind of a relationship. And you may decide that you don't want to have that kind of relationship anymore. And you want to exit. All right. You want to exit that. Well, just imagine what it might take. Okay. It could take something close to death even for you to get away from these people in order to be free of these kinds of people. There are people in the world who would rather die than to have to get a job. All right, there really are, and there always will be. And they will always f somehow float or arrive at positions of authority and power uh, where they will order people to, to, you know, to, to make bricks or, or, or they will beat them. You know, that, that kind of thing will always happen in one way or another. Uh, but uh, in verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And then he goes on. He says, you know, there are more examples of this, of living by faith, not by law, but living by faith. And great things happened. Great things happened. But the objective, of course, was to have a relationship with God. Right? When you live by the law, you don't need a relationship with God. Just obey. Repent and obey. That's it. All right. Will he ever bless you? No, because you'll never repent and obey to the satisfaction or to the criteria that is required in order for God to respond and bless you. So there is no relationship with God. But through the new covenant now, we do have a relationship with him as we have been set free from the law through the forgiveness of sins. Through the forgiveness of sins, we have been set free from the law. The law required obedience or death. Jesus died on our behalf. There you go. You know, there, there, the, the law has been fulfilled. It was not fulfilled by our obedience. It was fulfilled by the sacrifice of the Messiah to fulfill the demand of death by the law. Now that's been fulfilled. The law is fulfilled. It's over. All right, it's over. We are now able to enter into a new way of life. So the writer goes on and gives other examples saying, look, you know, this is nothing new. In verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. God told the people, he spoke to the people, says, go do this. Go do this. And they did that. They walked around for seven days. Okay. And so your relationship with your God will be at times he will share with you. Hey, will you go do this? Will you go be a part of this? All right. And, and as, you know, as those things happen, as those things happen, your relationship with your God is real. It's, it's OK. It's taking place. You are free to do that. And what may some of those things be? Will you just go talk to this person for 20 minutes? It could be as simple as that. They walked around for seven days by faith in verse 31. By faith, the, the harlot Rahab did not perish, and those who did not believe with, did, I'm sorry, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace, right? Because she was thinking about the future, that there is a future, there is something greater, that the Lord, the living God is doing something, and so 
you know, through the invitation and the opportunity to be a part of it, she decided to do so. In verse 32, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. You know, you can read through this and say, yeah, yeah, cheer them on. Quench the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And we're thinking these are all wonderful, great things, you know, that they are a part of the work of God. They are a part of something greater than, than themselves. The Lord is speaking with them personally. They are responding to the truth that is revealed to them. And look at all this great stuff that's happening. And then you keep reading, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, right? But they were sawn in. They were sawn in half. I mean, you're thinking all these great things are happening, and then we have these other things, and they are listed in the same context, because it's not about whether something is good or bad, or whether you have victory in war or whether you're sawn in half all right it does that's not what the issue is the issue is are you a part of something greater than yourself are you thinking and are you living in the context of an eternal experience do you have a relationship with your god such that if he calls upon you to do great things and experience great success or to do other things and experience great failure Will you rejoice? And will that be a legitimate expression of faith? You know, a lot of, a lot of Christians will look at this and they, they will look at other people. They'll look at you, look at your life or even their own and say, you know, if life is going bad, you know, if life, if life is hard, you know, maybe there's something wrong with your faith. People think that way, right? People believe that there's something wrong with your faith. You know, there have been many times when, when I have had si significant sufferings of life, you know, many times I've experienced great failures, great trauma, great suffering. You know, when, when, I, when I'm asked by people to give insights or counsel, in general, I am not the pastor who is of help to people because I am well studied. You know, and I think studying is great. I do, and I do a lot of that. But I'm the person who has been through a lot of these struggles themselves, you know, myself. I've been through these things. I've, I've lived through these things. I know what it is to experience a lot of problems in life. And, and, and when I encounter people who are going through those things, I'm able to encourage them with the encouragement that I received, the, the, with the comfort that, that I received from my God through my tribulations. I can comfort others with the comfort that I have received. And, you know, you know that, that's, just, that's just simply part of life, part of living our lives. And when I was going through these experiences, I didn't consider that I had some, some lack of faith or, or that there was some, some, some problem or some difficulty or some challenge with my relationship with God. You know, maybe, maybe I had some secret sin of some kind that I wasn't aware of. I didn't properly ask forgiveness for. That's what people would tell me. You know, they would tell me, well, Aaron, you know, gosh, you know, life is really awful for you. Things are really bad. And, and, and this is terrible. Obviously, there's something wrong with your relationship with God. There's something wrong with you. You need to fix this. And that's just not real. All right? That's just not what life is about. That's not what the work of God is about. It right? has nothing to do with these things at all. I was still listening to my God, responsive to my God. It just so happened that that was just a time when things in life were hard. All right, uh, continuing into verse, into verse 37. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, 
tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. All right, of whom the world was not worthy. The world was not worthy of these people, even though the world would look at these people and say that, they are, that these people are not worthy of the world. But the world was not worthy of them because in the midst of their trials and tribulations and sufferings, they had their God. They believed in their God. They trusted in their God. They responded to the truth that God had revealed to them. So regardless of what the circumstances of life were, they were children of God and the world was not worthy of them, those who knew their God, who believed in their God, who were children of God, who had eternal life, who were a part of something much greater than themselves. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. All right, they did not receive the promise. They did not receive the promise of the Messiah. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. All right, they live this way not having the Messiah. We get to have the Messiah. And now through the Messiah, we can reflect back on them. And now there is a connection between us and them that those were people who lived by faith. We are to now live by faith so that we can now have a personal connection with these people, that we now have the Messiah and that their perfection is not realized without us. So also our perfection is not realized without them and their example of the significance of living by faith. All right, in diverse, in diverse uh, uh, again in verse 39, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That is his conclusion, which also introduces a new subject. But this is what he says through chapter 11. He says, look, there is a new way of life. Enter into that new way of life. And we have plenty of witnesses in, the, in times past who, sh who, 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 who are showing us, they show us that there, is, that there is a life by faith, not by law. And we are to enter into that and to be a part of that that they were, so we are now, that we are all together a part of something much greater than ourselves that connects the present with the past and also establishes well the future that we have before us, to think about the future that we have. So that's Hebrews chapter 11. I will stop here. Uh, I, um, I don't have a question uh, with me, I have it on the, 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 the table over there, but the, but the question has to do with in what ways are you thinking about your future? In what ways are you thinking and considering what your future may be, what, your, what, what you may be a part of in the future? In what ways are you a part of the work of God that will have eternal consequences, not just your life, in the future, but also in others in the future and the years to come. That's the question that I that I have over there, and and uh, and I'd like to encourage you to, to just have some conversations about it. You, you you may not know, you know, but it, but in having some conversations about it and by asking the question, it, it 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 could be something that would then be on your mind to be attentive to, and so as something like that is realized, sometime in the years to come then you'll see the connection between, uh, between yourself and what you see here in Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, thank you.